Enchanté. Hello, welcome to Chateau Bory. I've tried recording this now, I don't even know how many times, but um, I was recording it outside and Chloe kept insisting through the whole thing that I throw the ball for her. So I finally gave up and now I'm trying again and doing it in the house where she's now soundly asleep after all of that work. So thank you to everybody who's subscribed and to new people who are joining me. It's been, uh, <laughs> it's been overwhelming, I'll have to say. I didn't expect quite the response that I'm now getting, so thank you. Um, I had a lot of questions about, you know, the price and what I paid and the process and how hard was it to buy a house in France if you're an American slash Canadian as I am. So I thought I would just kind of take you through as quickly as I can my process. Essentially, I started looking almost exactly a year ago. Well, I started looking many months prior, um, just looking online, um, getting myself familiar with various terminology like GEETS, which are um, the outbuildings that often you can turn into apartments that you can rent out as GEETS, rental properties. and. Um, I got familiar with all of the different sites um, that advertise French, French properties. So by the time I got to France for the first time to look at properties, I had a pretty good sense then of what I was looking for and I had several listed that I wanted to see and I had already arranged the appointments and that was actually quite hard to do sometimes just because you don't quite know how far you know it takes to get from point A to point B and you're having to deal with different people so all the realtors you know are local to their to their regions so I couldn't just find one realtor who would then take me all over France to look at the properties so that was that was the hardest thing about it I think was just arranging this whole little tour and managing to see all these different properties. I wound up, I think, driving about a thousand kilometers all over the place. And it was kind of funny because I realized I was crisscrossing back and back on myself a bunch of times. Because I remember sort of going, I've passed that chateau before and here I am again. So, but it was really good. And I saw a lot of different types of properties and I became familiar with the different types of properties there are. Obviously chateaus, we all know, big castles. Uh, a chateau really is a property that was once owned by nobility. So most of the homes that I was looking at, I wasn't, I looked at a couple of chateaus, but mostly I was looking at houses really like this one, which is technically not a chateau, although I call it one. It, to me, it's a chateau. <laughs> But technically, it's, a, it's what's called a maison de maître, a master's house, or what we might call in the United States and Canada, um, a, a mansion. So usually they were, they were owned by not necessarily nobility, but people in the upper echelons of society. And then um, I also looked at quite a few uh, hotel, hotel particulier, which uh, sometimes were used as hotels. They would tend to be um, right in town and they're often either a, an L shape or a U shape and one side of the L or the U is kind of right along the street. Like it's, it's, it's flush with the street and so the, the, the windows and doors look right onto the street. And then often in behind there's a courtyard of some kind. So I looked at quite a few of those as well and they are equally beautiful, uh, as beautiful as many of the chateaus that I looked at as well. So that's a possibility. And then I looked at a couple of um, MAS, MAS, uh, which are kind of more like farmhouses. They're often just 
on um, one or two floors and they're, they tend to be really long, long buildings with kind of a, either two hallways and rooms off that or one main hallway with rooms off that. Um, so they're sort of a different type of building again. Um, and ultimately, obviously, what I wound up with was a Maison de Maître um, in Chateau de Bory. So all that to say that last October, I, so October 2021, I saw probably 10 to 14, I kind of lost count, different properties. And uh, there, was, there was one hotel particular that I really, really liked, but it was a little out of my, my price range. Um, so I kind of didn't pounce on it and then, uh, came back home and I was really kind of thinking that that would be the end of it. Like I would get it out of my system and then I'd come back home and I would be bored with the whole thing and that would be it. But unfortunately it just amped up the obsession instead of <laughs> dampened it. So I wound up sort of back on the internet, still looking up places. And then I decided to come back in the spring. So I came back with my niece in um, May. And this time there were quite a few that we wanted to see, but that by the time I got here, they were under offer. So I didn't get to see them. So I can't remember again how many we saw, probably seven. And this was like the sixth of the seven. We saw one also in Agen right after this that was a complete dud, but um, so really I kind of think this is the last one that we saw. And we were here for about an hour and a half and <laughs> my niece was walking around going, this is unreal. She kept saying, this is unreal. Um, and so then I, I knew, you know, you just kind of know in your heart, like this was it. And a, a bunch of factors, played into that decision. One was that I realized that it was actually in really good shape and it had a brand new heating system. It had a brand new septic system. Its electrics were done in 2013. It had a new roof. So all of the things, all of the major works that most chateaus require were done and I wasn't gonna have to worry about them. So that was really huge. And so I began to realize that A, it was a house that I could maybe manage on my own. And really all it needed was some decor, you know, some furniture, some painting, some, you know, basic repairs. But I wasn't having to redo an entire roof or um, pull up floors or anything like that. Nothing structural. It was all in really good shape. So that played, a, that played a huge role in my making this decision. Um, and then obviously the property is just so unique. I mean, this whole troglodyte, the French call it the troglodytes, and which is funny because if you, if you look up in the dictionary, an English dictionary, what troglodyte means, it's basically a cave dweller, <laughs> often a sort of a monster inside a, inside a cave. Um, which makes me laugh because I'm kind of a bit of a hermit. So maybe I am a cave dweller. I'm a troglodyte. Anyhow, um, but the property is just so unique and beautiful. And it had the old garden. It has a beautiful view. It had the outbuildings in the caves. It had also the caretaker's cottage, which I will do a whole video on. Um, but it's really going to be spectacular. It needs to be completely gutted and redone. But... Uh, it'll be really cute. So, so really, that was only the that was really the only major work that I was going to have to do. Um, the other major work is the painting and repairing of the shutters and the exteriors of the windows. So, I have hired somebody to do that, and that will happen in the spring. So, all of this just played into my decision to <clears throat> to buy the house. So the process of buying um, is, it was pretty similar to buying a house anywhere else. Uh, I put in an offer, offer was ultimately accepted. Um, the house was originally for sale for 649,000 euros. Uh, I wound up getting it for 610,000 euros. 
And as it turned out, by the time I transferred the money, it was uh, pretty much par. So it wound up being about $610,000 US. So that was good. Um, we signed an offer. Uh, then we signed a purchase agreement. Um, I had to get things translated into French. And I found out about a good um, app called Deepl, D-E-E-P-L which, you know, I could just feed it uh, a document online and it would spit out uh, a translated version. And so that was incredibly helpful. Um, I did, uh, I, I paid someone to come and do an inspection. Uh, it's, you know, it's a pretty basic inspection. The, the French mandate um, some really intense inspections, particularly around um, lead paint. The lead paint, um, you know, results were pages and pages, probably a hundred pages. You know, they went through every single door, every single window, inside, outside, baseboards. I mean, it was intense. So I know every spot where there's lead paint. Um, they did asbestos, and there's just one small part of a downpipe, downspout, um, that's asbestos, and then uh, termite, and uh, I think that was it. Oh, septic. So, you know, it passed everything. Um, obviously there was lead paint, but you would expect that in a, in a house this old. So, so yeah, so uh, all went forward. I wound up um, not using a money transfer company, which had been recommended to me, but the whole thing felt so sketchy that I didn't, I didn't go that route. I sort of backed out of that at the last minute. I wound up just transferring um, the money using my bank and I transferred it into the bank of the notaire, the person who uh, you used to close the deal. So in France, uh, the, the lawyer that you used to um, you know, work on your deal, is uh, it's, he's a government appointed um, employee basically. So it's pretty common in France for both the buyer and the seller to use the same notaire, the same lawyer. So it just saves on time. The other thing that um, if you buy a rural property in France, there is a Department of Agriculture who has the first right of refusal on the property. So technically they can come in and decide that they want to turn your property into farmland and then they can buy it um, kind of out from under you it almost never happens so but every property has to go through this process and it usually takes three months i spent an extra 200 euros to have that process sped up so that i could close a little quicker so um so i was able to close uh at the beginning of august instead of it probably would have been the beginning of October instead. Um, so that was well worth the 200 euros for me. Um, so it was, it was definitely great to be here in the summer when um, it was easy to do, do the works, although easy in some ways and harder in another, <clears throat> just because in August, <laughs> most of France goes on vacation. So sometimes getting a bank account open was difficult. Um, which I guess kind of leads me into the bank account. So uh, I was not able to open a bank account until I think it was the day before I closed. Um, and then even then, like I couldn't get money transferred into it. Like it wasn't, it wasn't really a working bank account yet. And because I didn't have a bank account, I was unable to set up um, an account for my electricity and my other utilities. So I didn't have electricity for the first week that I was here. And so I had many people in the comments saying, you know, get a vacuum, <laughs> get, get, get tools. But I couldn't have used them even if I had them. So, um, and for all of you who said I needed a, 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 a blower, a leaf blower, don't worry, I have two now. <laughs> Uh, I also have two weed whackers, so I have an electric and a gas of each of those. <laughs> so, um, so yes, don't worry, I am getting the tools as I need them. Um, so yeah, having no electricity here for that first couple of first few days that I was here was really tricky. But um, I was they did a, they did set up the water right away, which was great. Anyhow. Um, 
overall, it was a pretty easy process, kind of, I would say easier than I really even expected. I thought it would be more convoluted, but it was actually pretty straightforward. So we'll see. I mean, hopefully nothing terrible comes out of it, but it'll be, it'll be interesting. So, um, so other people have asked also about the history of the house and I really have very little information except that the neighbor down below, her mother owned the house. She bought the house in 1965 from, I believe the doctor who did a lot of the work here. So uh, there was a doctor named Dr. Mahon. I think he bought the property around 19, Somehow, I can't tell if it was 1900 or if it was in the 1930s that he bought the house. Um, but he did a lot of renovation work in the 30s. So he was the one who put in all of the kind of the Art Nouveau, the, um, the staircase and the mosaic tiled floor in the sort of the green room with the little devils, the Diablos. Um, so he, he did a lot of that work. Um, I also found out from the neighbor that <clears throat> the house was added onto. So the reason that you have to kind of go upstairs when you're on the on the second floor is that it is the difference between where the old house ended and the new house begins. So this room I'm sitting in, if I'm to go by that, this room and all of these rooms along this side would be part of the new uh, addition, I think. But again, I'm a little sketchy on this. A lot of this information I was getting, and it was in French, <laughs> so um, might not have quite got all the details right. And there's literally no documents here whatsoever. Um, I did get some pictures of uh, some old floor plans from the 30s, but looking at the floor plans, I can't really tell if it was perhaps a plan that never got executed, or if it was how the house looked prior to the plan being executed. It's really impossible for me to tell, um, just because the stairs go in an ent entirely different direction, and um, yeah, it's sort of the, the entries are different. Anyway, it, it's, uh, I'll, I'll insert the, I'll insert the uh, floor plans here so you can see what I'm talking about, but, um, yeah, so apparently Dr. Maron is the one, I believe, who put this addition on, but maybe not. I'm kind of unclear about that. So what I would love to do is go back and see if I can find plans for the house, you know, from around somewhere between 1800 and 1900 Then I could see. I do know that the third floor with the porthole windows was, um, all of those bedrooms were put in by the owners that I bought it from. So they are all very recent, probably put in in, 19, in 2013, 2014 in there. Um, prior to that, it was really just a big empty attic space um, that didn't really have anything in it. So, so I mean, having 12 bedrooms and 12 bathrooms is great and it'll be awesome for doing the retreats. So now my job is really just to furnish them and I have been collecting furniture <laughs> all over the place. And uh, today, no, yesterday I went to an auction, a French auction, sort of an estate sale uh, for the first time. And so I, I, I got a little footage and some pictures. So I'll, I'll, I'll put that in here as I'm talking. Um, so that was really fun. And I got a few things there, which I'm going to shortly go and pick up. So, so that's essentially what I know about the history. The only other part of the history that I know is that the estate used to be 25 acres. It's now five acres. And that the woman, the neighbor's mom who bought it in 1965, it was 25 acres when she bought it and it was her who kind of divided the property. So the property used to be a wine estate. So there were vines uh, up on the plateau above and also down in the fields below. And then in, 18, in, in the 1850s, all across France, there was um, a blight that killed off most of the vines 
all over France. And the French wine market came to a grinding halt, apparently, and was ultimately saved. This is a small known fact, I feel like. Uh, it was ultimately saved by um, American vine stock. And so they imported the American vine stock and grafted it to what was left of the French wine stock. And it was, I guess, resistant to the blight. And that's how they brought back the French, the French wine industry. Otherwise, we wouldn't, there would be no French wines if it weren't for American, <laughs> American vine stock. Who knew? So this particular state never came back from the blight. So it just, I guess, got turned into farmer's fields and whatnot. I think they did grow quite a few plums and peaches and pears and apples, which is what this area is known for. And in fact, I was told that the bakery in the cave uh, was also used to um, dry the prunes, dry the plums into prunes. So I guess that's kind of what it became, but really it was a doctor's house. I don't know, you know, if he was sort of a, a gentleman farmer or whatever, but that's uh, that's kind of what I understand about the property. And then, as I say, the neighbor's mother, she divided the property. So the neighbor lives in what was the old, um, the old sheep barn, and um, it's been converted. She's converted it uh, with her husband into a, ho a home. It's a, it's like a long kind of barn and um, they've kind of, it's, it's quite interesting how, you know, how they've renovated it. Um, so she got that and that property. Um, the plateau, the area uh, on the plateau was sold off and it now is um, a housing complex. There's, apparently there's 300 homes up there. That's how big it was. And then there's another property um, sort of on the other side of the lane and, and then my property, which is, as I say, it's about five acres. So that's pretty much everything I know about the history. That's been my process so far. So as I say, uh, this week I've been here, I don't even know, four days, slowly coming out of jet lag. I've had a, 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 a man here who came for a couple of days and did a lot of, a lot of the yard work. He is, you know, he cut, he had to cut hard, really hard, the topiaries, the big, the boules, the big balls, which was really heartbreaking. I'm told they will grow back. So the problem with the topiaries is that they are boxwood and all over France, all over Europe, I guess, uh, the boxwoods have been attacked since about 2008. They've been attacked by boxwood caterpillar and which I guess was brought over from Asia. It's kind of killing, killing all these amazing topiaries. So uh, you have to find different ways of dealing with them, either pheromone traps or spraying or whatever. So, but part of it is that you have to sort of trim back as much as possible all the, the dead, um, the dead wood, and then just start spraying them on a regular basis. So I've been, Learning, it's been a, it's been an interesting um, learning process trying to figure out how to how to save the topiaries. He trimmed up some of the bushes along the driveway, so it's looking quite a state like. Oh, and he also cleared out the whole area around the front gate, um, which looks just amazing now. So, anyway, so that's been really exciting. And then, as I say, I went to uh, this auction yesterday. That's been really fun as well. So that's where I'm at right now. Uh, next week it's painting week, so um, there's gonna be a lot of painting going. <laughs> so, and I'll be doing that by myself. It's, it's very zen, I, I actually enjoy painting, so it will be good. And uh, I don't know, I'll throw in some, uh, I'll throw in some time-lapse photography of me doing that because I know how satisfying that is, having been the, the watcher of so many of the uh, other Chateau videos. This is my first attempt using the gimbal. This is kind of exciting. Is it nice and smooth? <laughs> no more need from Dramamine. And now let's zoom. Let's try zoom. Ooh. 
how exciting. Stay back. All right, we're gonna walk up here, check this out. It's looking like a, almost a proper kind of a state now. It's funny what happens when you just trim a few bushes. the gate because he's cleaned up all around the gate as well. And now from here, I don't know if you can see down below here, try and zoom, but there's the chicken coop and there's a pool down there. I'll do another tour of that. And here's a better view of the pool. So that's sort of one of the many kind of drainage pools. But all of the pools are empty here now because it's been so dry. So there's no water anywhere. And there is my grotto. There's <laughs> another view of the pool. Chicken coop. towards the cleaned up gate. It's just wild how different this looks. So these are more pools down here. Of course, completely empty, just filled with leaves and debris. And my gate, which I have left open, <laughs> A whole little pathway. Look at this. This is amazing. My little, oh, even more of a grotto in there. Isn't this cool? Oh my gosh, there's a key for the gate. Look at that. Huh. Wow, it has a thing that's lost it's in the mailbox. Alright, well, it doesn't seem to turn at all. There we go. Interesting. I guess this could potentially be an electric gate, but for now. Almost tripped, sorry. And voila. It's all cleared up. Amazing. Amazing. So now the view of the house. So the M on the gate stands for Marron, which is the name of the doctor who owned this house. Gosh, probably around, I think he bought it around 1900 and the family owned it until about 1965. Um, he was a doctor in town and um, he did a lot of the big renovations, particularly the ones that happened around uh, the 1930s, I think. So the Art Deco aspect of the house, the stairway and the mosaic tiled floor with the Diablos in the corners, the little devil faces. So um, yeah, so that's why there's M's everywhere on the gates and stuff. And uh, I think he also would have done a lot of the uh, drainage work here and put in a lot of these pools and whatnot. So. Yeah, but man, just a little bit of cleaning up makes massive amounts of difference. This hedge is just wild. <laughs> so exciting. All right, that's it for now. Uh, thank you again for subscribing. And if you haven't already, please do. And um, hit the bells and likes and whatever you're supposed to do on YouTube. And um, thank you. Thank you for your patronage. All right, be well.